And if you're looking at this passage and thinking, how long is it going to be today? You can be very glad that I cut out preaching on chapter 27. I had a good bit of chapter 27 prepared. I was going to slot it in there as well so I would get finished before I go away. But I didn't. So <clears throat> you'll not go home to burnt offerings, hopefully. Uh, we never. There's lots to learn here in Leviticus 26. I won't, brother. I, was, <laughs> I trust not, anyway. I trust not. But we'll try to, obviously you can't expound every single text in detail. I trust by the end you'll have the sense, as it were, and know what this passage is saying to us in our day. Let's bow together in prayer. Let's all seek the Lord and just look for His help. Lord, we are living in days that grieve the heart and yet I confess my heart is not half grieved enough. Lord, bring the burden of a dark day heavily upon thy people. Let every Christian feel the weight of judgment that begins at the house of God. Let every Christian feel the weight of responsibility and duty. Let every Christian come with surrendered hearts that by the grace of God they will do everything, we will do everything in our power to show thy glory to this generation. Help us in the meditation of the word. Keep our minds alert, our hearts in tune. May all of us be humbled and any outside of Christ even be saved this very day. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Fill me with thy spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. The temptation that people have when they come to Leviticus chapter 26 is to relegate it to a place of irrelevance. We are not Israel. We are not the nation as it was then. And thus these blessings and threatenings have nothing to say to us. I trust that for those who are regular attenders in this church that you will have the wisdom by now to realize that every single chapter has some application to us in these days. As we come to the end of the book, we should have realized that Leviticus has much more to say to us than what might appear at first glance. The passage before us, while it deals with obedience and disobedience, is not a call to works righteousness. It's not. It's not calling us to work for our salvation. It's a call to covenant faithfulness. And if that doesn't mean anything to you, I trust that I will make it more clear as we progress. We dealt with it in our larger catechism reading, the fact that Adam, by his disobedience, by breaking what is known by theologians as the covenant of works, plunged all his posterity into sin and misery, and thus all the consequences of the breaking of that covenant are experienced by us, his children. The covenant was broken and that faced consequences. Adam failed to keep the covenant of works. God told him, don't eat of that fruit. That's the work I'm asking you to do. Eat of everything else, just not that. But the day you eat thereof, you will die. And the reason, therefore, man experiences death is because of this. However, the reason man can also experience eternal life and salvation is because of Jesus Christ, the last Adam. He is the one who comes to represent all the people of God and to fulfill the covenant of works that Adam broke and we can't fulfill. And therefore, offering to his Father a perfect righteousness, 
of works that are pleasing to God and imputing it, gifting it to us who believe in his name. You can read in 1 Corinthians uh, about the, the first Adam, the last Adam, 1 Corinthians 15. Alan Cairns says in his Dictionary of Theological Terms, he says this, What is for believers a covenant of pure grace, where we are saved by no works of our own, is for Christ, in one respect, a covenant of works, for it depends entirely upon his perfect obedience. It is also, of course, a covenant of grace, in that only free grace could appoint and accept Christ's vicarious obedience on behalf of believers, end quote. What he's saying there is that Christ came as one to fulfill the covenant of works, but it's not solely fulfilling the covenant of works because it's by grace he even came to do that. The covenant of works did not demand the Son of God come, and so it's only by the grace of God that the Son of God says, I will go, and I will live out the law on their behalf, fulfill all righteousness for them, and and reconcile them to God. This is a huge subject, but I bring it up because it's important. In understanding this chapter, you will note the word covenant several times through Leviticus chapter 26, verse 9, you will find it, where it says, I will have respect unto you and make you fruitful and multiply you and establish my covenant with you. Also verse 15 if ye shall despise my statutes, or if your soul abhor my judgments, so that ye will not do all my commandments, but that ye break my covenant. Verse 25, I will bring a sword upon you that shall avenge the quarrel of my covenant. And then when you come to the end, verses 42, 44, and 45 all make several references to the word covenant. So we read the word covenant, we have to ask, ask well, what covenant is it referring to? Is it some unique covenant that was there for Israel and has no relevance to us. And I say to you, beloved, no. No. This is the covenant of grace. The covenant of grace we enjoy and live under today as Christians in the New Testament era. And I make that argument because of the language that's also used in this passage, such as verse 12. Look at verse 12. I will walk among you and will be your God and ye shall be my people. That is the covenant promise that is in relation to the covenant of grace. It is God's promise to be our God and walk with us and we be his people. And that is what we enjoy as Christians today. It's not any different. That wasn't unique to Israel. That was Israel experiencing what every child of God knows who's in Christ. God being among us, walking with us, and we being his people. There are many, many references of this passage and of this language. I turn you to one, just because we're in the introduction, I don't want to get too bogged down here, but 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, <clears throat> and you get the call from verse 14 to not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, there's no fellowship those who are righteous have no fellowship with those who are in darkness and so on. So you can't be joined together. It's not saying you can't talk to your unsaved work colleague, but you can't be joined together. You can't be in union with them because you're in union with Christ. Look at verse 16. What agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. This is a promise. This is a promise that has been given to us as the people of God that if we are in the covenant of grace, this covenant of grace promises this glorious truth that God is our God. We are His people and He walks with us. It's the basis of the language when you quote it to yourself so often when you're in despair and darkness, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. What's the basis of that promise? It's this covenant promise. God is our God. He never leaves us. And so, with that kind of language in Leviticus 26, we cannot ignore the fact that he is dealing, in a sense, with the same covenant we are in today. When I talk about covenant, I'm talking about promise. God's promise to be our God, which he has done in Christ, 
that Jesus Christ, by his life, by his death, by his resurrection, he has accomplished all necessary to reconcile us to God, and we therefore being reconciled become his people. For those who think that these blessings and threatenings are only for Israel, they ignore the experience of the New Testament church. Because there were those who were covenant people. They were in the covenant community and God treated them kind of like he talks about here in Leviticus 26. Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira. They lie, they lie to God, they blaspheme his name and they're cut off. Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 11. When they're not entering into the Lord's table in the right fashion, when they're engaging in gluttony and severing the rich from the poor and so on, some of them died and some were sick. The churches in Revelation that the Lord tells John to write to in Revelation 2 and 3, most of them not only get commendation for their good, but also warnings against their sin. And if they don't, if they don't keep the covenant, if they don't be faithful to God, he will withdraw his presence. So it has not gone away. What becomes clear with the study of the entirety of Scripture, which is our problem, we don't know all the Word of God well enough. Unlike the old saints, unlike many of the people of God in a bygone era, they read their Bible cover to cover, they studied it every part, they didn't just pass over the bits that were difficult, they mined out the Word of God from every part of Scripture. And when you study Scripture carefully, you'll see that it's the true keepers of the covenant that are true followers of Christ. And because they are true followers of Christ, they, they serve God in obedience. That's the natural outcome. That's the fruit. Obedience is the fruit of one truly saved. And so, as we're seeing, seeing these blessings upon obedience, they are blessings upon those who believe. And because they believe, they live in obedience to God. And those who don't believe, don't live in obedience to God. It's not just works. It's not just here, people, well, if you live in obedience, I'll bless you this way. You live in disobedience, I'll curse you this way. The people who obey do because they have faith in their Messiah. And the people who disobey, disobey because they do not have faith in their Messiah. One of the first fruits of their disobedience is idolatry. Because they don't have faith in the true God, they turn and put, exercise a vain faith in a vain God. This is why Hebrews chapter 4 Verse 2 says this, the writer to the Hebrews, correlating the present need to keep those Hebrew believers where they ought to be following Christ and not backslide as it were, is calling them not to be like those in the past. Hebrews 4 verse 2 says, for unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. That's those in the past. That's our fathers, those who came out of Egypt and so on. The gospel was preached unto us as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them. Why did it not profit them? Not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. It wasn't mixed with faith. So here's the word preached right here, Leviticus 26. Moses standing up and he's preaching the word, this truth to them. And they didn't take it to heart and generations didn't live it out. Why? Because it wasn't mixed with faith. They didn't believe in God. They didn't rest in Salvation in that which was provided by God as foreshadowed in all these sacrifices pointing to the Lamb of God that would take away the sin of the world. So we learn then that the keepers of the covenant in the Old Testament are those who have faith. Caleb and Joshua did not go the way of the ten spies who brought an evil report. Why? Because they're better men in and of themselves? No. They have faith in God. And they knew their deliverance would come from God. But it was faith that wrought the obedience in their hearts. The others didn't have faith. <laughs> they obviously didn't have faith. God had just delivered them out of Egypt without any weapons, and now they're looking to these other lands that are far more inferior to Egypt and they can't see how deliverance will be wrought. And clearly, they do not believe in God. They have no faith. And so, faith produces obedience. Unbelief produces disobedience. And we need to keep that in mind as we look at Leviticus chapter 26. 
And so, as he deals with the language of covenant, he talks about those who break the covenant, doesn't he? Verse 15, If he shall despise my statutes, or if your soul abhor my judgments, so that ye will not do all my commandments, but that ye break my covenant, I also will do this unto you. You break my covenant. The covenant breaker is not one who just does bad things, but he is one who refuses to believe in Christ. And that's why he disobeys. And so God gives the promise of blessing and the promise of judgment to the covenant community and says, you obey the covenant, blessings come. You believe in me, blessings. You disobey, you rebel against the covenant, you don't have faith, and you go your own way, judgment will come. You will be a covenant breaker. So as we look at Leviticus chapter 26, I've entitled it, A Call to Covenant Faithfulness. A Call to Covenant Faithfulness. First, the primary law of covenant faithfulness. The primary law of covenant faithfulness. Look at verses 1 and 2. He shall make you no idols nor graven image, neither rear you up a standing image, neither shall you set up any image of stone in your land to bow down unto it, for I am the Lord your God. He shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. The Lord Jesus told us in Matthew 22, verses 37 through 40, he said this, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and prophets. And so, in a sense, you can see the law as hanging on two commandments. And it hangs there as he says, You have that which is offered to God and that which we do to man. Now, the opening four commandments of the Decalogue in Exodus chapter 20 deal with our offering to God, what we do to God. That is the first commandment, how we relate to God. And that is key. And that's what we find in verses 1 through 2. You will find these commandments dealt with. We are to have no other God but the true and living God. We are not to worship Him in the wrong way, making images and so on. We are to keep all the Sabbaths that He has appointed. That's the fourth commandment. And we're to reverence the place where God dwells. You see that? Reverence my sanctuary. Where God is, we are to reverence. In other words, we're not to blaspheme His name in this way. It is an act of sacrilege to misuse the Lord's day and as blasphemy of His name. So all the four commandments are really put into those first two verses. And they are foundational. They are foundational. And the degree to which we obey them will be the greatest governing factor of our character. Follow me on this. Your character as a Christian will be more influenced by how you keep the first four commandments than how you endeavor to keep the other six. Most people think it's all about, you know, treating my neighbor as myself. Well, that's true. We are to do that. Clearly, that's the mind of the Lord. And the last six commandments deal with that. And so we honor our father and our mother and we don't commit adultery and we don't lie and we don't steal and we don't covet and so on. So we don't do those things toward man, but it is the first four, how we give ourselves to the first four that shapes our character. My fear of God will govern how I relate to man. My reverencing of his name, not blaspheming his name, will, 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 will if, I, if I speak in such a way where I will not blaspheme God, then I'll be very careful in my speech toward man, won't I? And on and on it goes. I don't want to develop this too much. But John Calvin says this. The old Genevan French reformer who labored in Geneva, he says, Surely the first foundation of righteousness is the worship of God. When this is overthrown, all the remaining parts of righteousness, like the pieces of a shattered and fallen building, are mangled and scattered. What kind, listen, what kind of righteousness will you call it? not to harass men with theft and plundering, if through impious sacrilege you at the same time deprive God's majesty of its glory, or that you do not defile your body with fornication, if with your blasphemies you profane God's most holy name, or that you do not slay a man if you strive to kill and to quench the remembrance of God. It is vain to cry out righteousness without religion. This is as unreasonable as to display a mutilated, decapitated body as something beautiful. Not only is religion the chief part, but the very soul whereby the whole 
breathes and thrives. First four commandments. And that's what's laid out in the opening two verses. And this is the primary law of covenant faithfulness. If we are to be faithful to God, then we must be thinking about those first four commandments and living them out in obedience to His name. Secondly, the promised blessings of covenant faithfulness. The promised blessings. Verses 3 through 13 deal with the blessings, the good things, the encouragements that if we keep His covenant, that is, we trust in Christ and we live for Him, then here's what's promised to us. First, His provision. Verses 3 through 5 and verse 10 deal with His provision. You look at, we'll just step in at verse 4. Then will I give you rain in due season, and the land shall yield her increase, and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit, and so on. What's he saying? You will get all the provision you need. You'll get your provision. I'll provide for you. Again, this comes into the New Testament, doesn't it? Matthew chapter 6. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That is, worship God. Give your heart to those first four commandments, worshiping God. Giving our heart to God, loving God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and being. And then, what happens? All these things will be added onto you. You'll get provision. You'll not have to worry where the rain will come from. Rain will come. All the provision will come. Now, we don't live in a form of, of agriculture, but the same applies. They live, lived in such a culture where uh, plowing up the land and having trees for fruit and so on were very important, but... The point of this is, beloved, we are to live out our obedience in our employment. We are to obey God in every area of our lives. We are not to divide our lives. Well, here's the religious, I go to church on Sunday. And then the rest of the week is just my work and my enjoyment and my pastimes and whatever. And, and God doesn't really matter in that time. That is, that is not Christian. That is not Christian. I've emphasized this and I emphasize it again. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 30 whether we eat or whether we drink, we are to do all to the glory of God. Even in eating and drinking. Even in eating and drinking. That, that which you do three times a day, four, five, <laughs> some of us too many times a day. We eat to the glory of God. We do. And bless God for food. Bless Him. Oh, praise His name. He provides. He puts food on the table and we rejoice in His provision. He promises that provision for us as we live for Him and keep His covenant and love Him. Verse 6, he promises peace. I will give peace in the land, and ye shall lie down, and none shall make you afraid. And I will rid evil beasts out of the land, neither shall your sword go through the land. <clears throat> peace. That's what he's promising. You will get peace. Now, it's not a peace that promises no trouble, because later he says, ye shall chase your enemies. So you may have enemies who come and attack. They'll come after you, but you will still have peace. You will know peace. God will give peace. A sense of peace which reassures your heart of God's favor even when the difficult times come. The difficult times aren't the problem, you know. It is not having the peace of God in the difficult times. That's the problem. Christians throughout the centuries have had untold difficulties and struggles that exceed a hundredfold what anyone here has had to face. And they've done it with joy. They have done it with joy. Because God is with them. He gives peace. And Christians are meant to be peacemakers. They are. We are not to glory in war. Sometimes it's necessary. You have to chase out your enemies. But we are not to glory in war. We are not. Sometimes I wonder, I wonder, I, I'm no expert in this and I could be entirely barking up the wrong tree as it were, but I wonder if the mental trauma and stress known by some soldiers after war it's caused by an inability to reconcile their work with what they know to be morally right. But this is a rule for all Christians. We are to be peacemakers and we are to not just experience peace, but give peace, reflect peace. It's not peace at the expense of truth, but when we're even standing for truth, it ought to be with a spirit of peace. Some Christians, when they talk about taking a stand for God, the spirit is all wrong. The stand is right. The stand is right. But the spirit is wrong. And that matters. It does. Some people just love being contentious. 
They love being in the flames of contention. <clears throat> they love, I remember <clears throat> one minister, whenever I was involved in open air work, and I was working with that man I've mentioned on many occasions, Brother Albert, who's in glory now, who had been in the open air for over 50 years, and I was with him all the time and preaching with him. And this minister said to me, you know, that's, a, that's, that's brilliant. He said, be involved there, keep that going. He said, because the day might come whenever the government says you can't do this anymore. And they will find it much more difficult to stop you if you can say, we have been doing this for 50 years. It'll be much more difficult. If you say, every Saturday we've stood here for 50 years, you're going to take that away. He said, but what will happen is if they ever come to that point where they make it illegal to preach on the streets, you'll find all these martyrs, as it were, who will always, all of a sudden, find the burden to go and preach in the street. And I want to be seen as those suffering for Jesus' sake. Oh, look at me, aren't I suffering such a great deal? And they didn't stand on the street when they could. They have a wrong motive. Some Christians seem to be devoid of the emotional intelligence and lacking the spiritual discernment and how to look at a situation of conflict and see how peace might be promoted. And that's sad. They do much harm to the glory, to the kingdom of God. But peace will be something God promises. And of course, this is, this is something God given too. I mean, you can work all you like for peace, but if God's not going to give it, it's not going to happen. So that's why we pray. We pray constantly, Lord, keep peace in this church. By your spirit, give us a unity in this place. Then power is promised, verses 7 through 9. Ye shall chase your enemies, and they shall fall before you by the sword. Five of you shall chase an hundred, and so on. See this? Power. If they have to face enemies, they will have power. Unusual power. Five will chase a hundred. Now you see this in certain occasions, don't you? You see certain men. You have Shamgar with his ox gold, and he, 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 he tremendous <laughs> what he does with an ox gold there in Judges. And you have Samson, of course, as well, with the jawbone. Uh, he, you know, this extraordinary power when God's with us. And he promises this to his people if they obey him and live for him. And you see through the Psalms how David understood this as well. As you read through the Psalms, you see particularly David, as he faces his enemies, what does he do? He brings it all to God and says, Lord, smash your jaw, smash your teeth, destroy. Destroy them. It's your battle, not mine. He also promises his presence. This is the key, verses 11 through 13. This, this is above and beyond anything we need. It is his presence. I will set my tabernacle among you. My soul shall not abhor you. And I will walk among you and will be your God. And you shall be my people and so on and so forth. I will be with you. His presence. This is the key, dear child of God. This is the key of your life. You need the presence of God. The experience of the presence of God more than you need anything else. All the time, if I have the presence of God, if I only have the presence of God, God in my life, God working with me, in me, through me, every victory bar none in the scriptures, Old Testament and new, has always come for the people of God when God was with them. Always. Always. So whether it's God carving a path through the Red Sea, or God being with David before Goliath. Or God being with Peter on the day of Pentecost before all the Jews and seeing 3,000 slain, as it were, by the gospel. It is God being with them. And that is our crying need constantly. Every morning you get up, Lord, be with me today. Be with me today. I have no idea what I will face. I have no idea what conversations I will be in, what wisdom I will require. I need your presence. Be with me, Lord. And this is his problem, promise to his people that he will never leave us nor forsake us. And we can appeal to him, therefore, to intensify his presence in our lives. We need his presence. And this language, again, of verse 12, as I've said already, is, a, is, is the fulfillment really at its foundational level of his covenant promise, too, that you believe this is what you enjoy. Right here. I will walk among you and will be your God and you shall be my people. And as eschatological, it is going right into the future. What we know of it now is nothing of what we will know in eternity to come. Turn with me quickly to Revelation 21. 
I told you that this verse and this promise is iterated from Genesis through Revelation. And at the end of Revelation nearly, in chapter 21, verse 3, as John has given this picture, his vision rather, of a new heaven, a new earth, and then he sees the new Jerusalem coming down. This is the church. This is the church coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Verse 3, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. Where God dwells is with men. And he will dwell with them. They shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. And then it says, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death. In other words, all the blessings, all the blessings of Leviticus 26 are fulfilled gloriously in eternity in a wonderful way. And they will have this experience because God is their God and we are his people and he dwells with us. It's right there. The same promise from Genesis through Revelation as, as right through the scriptures and it is the covenant of grace, beloved. It is grace. What have we done to deserve the presence of God? What have we done? The only presence of God we deserve is that which brings us wrath and judgment. We have sinned. We have broken His holy law. We have not kept perfectly all His commandments. But He comes and He says, look, believe, believe gospel truth. And I will be your God. You will be my people. You will be like David. You will be able to say, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I have no wants because He is my shepherd. None. No wants. Think of that. No wants. Because the Lord is my shepherd and he feeds me as one of his sheep. He tends to me. He knows what I need every given moment. He comes and he has covenanted. Listen, he has covenanted, promised, vowed. He will never leave us. He will always provide if we are in this covenant of grace. If we are living it out and enjoying it by faith. This is glorious. That brings us thirdly. We've seen the primary law of covenant faithfulness, the promised blessings of covenant faithfulness. We then see the promised judgments for covenant unfaithfulness. In verses 14 through 39, obviously I'm not going to read all of these verses, but God is threatening them, we might say. Verse 4, But if ye will not hearken unto me, and will not do all these commandments, and if ye shall despise my statutes, or if your soul abhor my judgments, so that ye will not do all my commandments, but that ye break my covenant, I also will do this unto you. And on it goes, explaining the degrees of judgment that they will know for breaking the covenant. God is threatening them because they have a danger, there is a danger of breaking the covenant, of breaking the covenant that they're in. Now, to break the covenant is what we might term spiritual apostasy. The Amorites couldn't break the covenant. They weren't in it. But the people here could. They could break the covenant. Where one knows the truth and has the mark of the community, as it was then in circumcision, yet turns from the truth, their turning is a breaking of the covenant. They are what we term part of the visible church, part of a visible body that identifies belonging to God, and if anyone rebels, they are covenant breakers. They're covenant breakers. Now, language like this can be seen through the book of Hebrews. And I'll just read one passage with you, Hebrews chapter 6, where you can see when people get all confused about how to interpret Hebrews chapter 6 and passages like it, where they see people turning away from the Lord. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 4. Just a little section here. There's other passages we could turn to, but it says, it is impossible. Hebrews 6 verse 4. It is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. If they shall fall away, if they should apostatize, to renew them again unto repentance, 
seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. In the book of Hebrews, you have believers that are being addressed most solemnly. It's a very solemn book because the, Jews, the Jewish believers, as they approach the judgment upon Jerusalem, there's much persecution toward them as Christians, as followers of their Messiah, and they're feeling the heat, and they're tempted, they're being told, you don't have the sacrifices, you don't have a priesthood, you don't have this, that, and the other. And the writer to the Hebrews addresses all those points, gives a polemic to argue that Christ fulfills all of that, and he is greater than the angels, he is greater than Moses, he is greater than Joshua, so on and so forth. He is greater than everything. And if you turn away, as he says in Hebrews 2 verse 3, how, how, just think of this question, how shall ye escape if ye neglect so great salvation? How? Where are you going to go? There's nowhere to go. And there are these people then, and they are moving away, and they're turning away, and they're breaking the covenant, as it were. They're moving from the covenant community. Now, in the New Testament era, the mark of the covenant is baptism. We baptize people because they belong to a community. Christians, they're believers, so we baptize them. It's a sign you're part of that community. And if you're here this morning and you're not baptized and you profess to believe in Jesus Christ, you need to be baptized. You need to be. And so if we restrict, this is a question that some might have to wrestle with. If we restrict the covenant sign only to those who are genuine believers, or to use another term, only to the elect, we have a problem in that you don't have covenant breakers. They can't break the covenant because they're considered they're not in the covenant. But the Bible shows us that people can break the covenant. What covenant are they breaking? Thus, if you can follow me, the covenant breaker breaks the covenant through unbelief. That's what Hebrews 4.2 says. The word did not profit not being mixed with faith. They break the covenant because they don't exercise faith in Jesus Christ. And so, there must be a way in which someone can become part of the covenant even though they're not elect. How? Well, this is why, after the Protestant Reformation, you have men of God examining the Scriptures, and they realize that this mark of being part of the covenant community is for the children of believers. It is. So Presbyterians... Congregationalists, Anglicans, and many others, they've always baptized their children. They always have. Now, we're Presbyterian in government, and we're open on baptism, and I'm very glad. I don't have to fight with anyone then. I have to argue about it, and I see how this has not really brought much fruit to the church to fight over this issue. And so we unite under Christ our head, and we allow our consciences to be exercised in whatever way we see fit. But this is why, this is why, they have always, we might say, nearly all, listen, nearly all the greatest Christian minds in the history of the church believed children should be baptized. Not as irrefutable. And because children of believers are born into the covenant and should therefore receive the sign of the covenant, this passage applies to them that if they reject that sign, they're in that promise. And you can talk. And I've talked to my children like this. I said, you have a promise. A promise that guarantees you life if you believe in Jesus Christ. If you don't believe, if you don't believe you break the covenant, you're judged, you'll be judged more severely than anyone that even has never enjoyed or tasted of the heavenly gift. You'll be judged more severely. This is why, this is why, see the worst people in our present society, take the music industry, you take the music industry, see the most vile, the most vile, take Miley Cyrus or whoever, you're all part of the church growing up. And God has removed His grace so far that they have a moral fiber that's even worse than those who never were in the church to begin with. God judges them most severely. Most severely. Children who grow up and live in unbelief Outright, outrightly rejecting the gospel become covenant breakers. 
Now, there's more I could say on that. I'm not trying to deal with baptism, but it's very relevant here because it's dealing with the covenant. Why these people had this covenant with God has to be seen even as it relates to us today. And this section that we have here before us, verses 14 through 39, is broken up into five distinct areas which build one on top of the other. And they have conditional statements. I'm not going to read over it all. But you'll see, if you do this, then this will happen. And you will note there's a slow progression, a very slow progression in how God sends his discipline to men. Very so, slow. The first cycle, verses 14 through 17, deal with God t terrorizing them in certain ways. Um, you can see consumption, there's sickness and so on that comes, sorrow of heart. Mental distress, we might say. Depression, mental distress, agony. It's one of the first judgments that God brings upon them as well as sickness and so on, terrorizing them in other ways. The second cycle, verses 18 through 20. They lose their influence as a nation. Agriculturally, they begin to fail. They don't experience economic prosperity. They begin to lose out pros in, in, in prosperity in, in, in that kind of way. Verses 21, 22 is the third cycle. You get kind of domestic terror, wild animals coming in, doing very unusual things, taking their children away. The fourth cycle, verses 23 through 26, you have military invasion, famine, these kind of things come. And then the fifth cycle, the final one, is where the nation completely crumbles and disintegrates. Judgment comes upon them in a heavy way, and they are taken into exile. Now that happens very slowly, very, very slowly. Generation upon generation of disobedience heaps to them a progress of judgment. Now Israel has been through, as a nation, has been through the full cycle of all five on three occasions. They have. First, the exile of the northern kingdom. You have the northern kingdom of Israel with the ten tribes. And every single northern king, every single one was wicked. Every single one. And eventually God sends the Assyrians in to remove them and bring them into exile in 740 BC. The southern kingdom, Judah, Benjamin and Judah, they have some godly kings. They, they have some good men, Hezekiah and so on. They walk with God and try to issue restoration and revival and reformation. And so... They have some mercy shown toward them, but eventually judgment comes to them too. In 586 BC, where the Babylonians come in and bring them into exile, where they stay for 70 years. Then we have the third, when the Messiah comes to fulfill all that the sacrifice has typified, everything that God had promised to be the Savior of the nation and of the world. And they reject Him, they crucify